everyone, I'm Alexia Thomas and I'm with the media team here at Potomac Valley Church. I'm really looking forward to worship and excited to praise God for what he's done. We're also excited here on the media team about giving the opportunity to as many people as possible to hear the word of God and to spread light through the digital world. The best way to do that is to click follow and subscribe. That way you can be with us for every step. You wanna take it a step further? Then click the share button right now and let your friends and family know what you've learned, how your day has changed, how your life has changed. All right, have a great service. Good morning and welcome to Sunday service with the Potomac Valley Church, a community for all people committed to learning what it means to be the church. We're so glad you decided to join us for worship this morning. We hope and pray that this is a time that you are able to connect to one another, to the word, but most importantly, to worship God. Let's continue with some songs of worship.
encourage my soul and let us journey on before the night is done and I am far from home oh thanks be to God the morning light of his courage encourage my soul Miracles when you move, such an easy thing for you to do. Well, your hand is moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus. And your voice is calling me out. Yeah. 
Greetings, everyone. I'm Jasmine Valencia, and I'd like to share some information about giving financially at our church. Before we talk about how to give, let's talk about where it goes. Whenever you give to the Potomac Valley Church, you'll have three options to specify where that money goes. General operations, which supports our church's operating expenses. Benevolence, which we save separately in order to provide for members in crisis or community members who come to us in need. And lastly, missions, which is the most wide-reaching category that serves needs locally and abroad with our family of churches and the communities we serve. Speaking of missions, we are quickly approaching Missions Giving Sunday. This year, our goal is to raise $150,000. We have seen God take what we have given and multiply its impact in incredible ways. We're praying for the same to be done this year. This is something our members participate in annually but we welcome anyone from our broader community to take part in the special offering. Now that we know where your financial gift will go, let's talk about how to give. For those of you prepared to give today, you can give online through your own bank using the bill pay function. You can give using easy and secure payments through our Church Center mobile app. Finally, you can mail your own check or money order to our church office and payments will be processed through our bank weekly. If you missed anything or need additional details and clarification, you can find all of this and more on our website at www.potomacvalleychurch.com forward slash give. Thank you for your participation and heart to serve with a financial gift today. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Potomac Valley Church. We're super grateful that you join us for worship. You know, God has really moved in an incredible way uh, over the course of this week. And I pray that as you join us for this message, this second of seven messages on hospitality, that it truly is a time that helps you to hear God's voice and to really respond to Him. You know, we started out last week by talking about the fact that it all begins with hospitality. And I gave you a challenge last week to memorize a scripture in Leviticus. And uh, I know we've made tons of jokes about all sorts of special laws that we find in Leviticus, you know, like laws about mildew, but there's so much rich depth across God's word and definitely in this amazing book of Leviticus. And in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 33, here was a scripture that we memorized last week and that we're going to revisit this week as we continue our conversation. It says, when a foreigner lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The foreigner living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. God's heart is that we would love all people, that we would love people that are native to the place that we're from or native to the culture that we're a part of, and we love people that are foreign to the place that we're from or foreign to the culture that we're a part of. This conviction, this sensibility is what informed Jesus as he moved about in the world because he is the image of the invisible God. He is the word made flesh and this word is from him too. He loves and loved all people. 
You know, Jesus shows us the example of what it means to truly be hospitable. And this week, we're going to continue our conversations. We talk about the fact that it all begins with hospitality, to talk about offering hospitality in a hostile world. The world that Jesus lived in, the world that God planted Jesus in, was a hostile world. One filled with ethnic tension and political strife. One filled with violence and the domination of the Roman Empire. There was troubles within and troubles without. The Jewish leadership in many ways had lost their way and had become so engrossed in following rules that they lost the sense of what it really meant to follow God. You know, the truth is, if we were to fast forward from the first century to the 21st century, we could say the same thing about our world today. We live in a hostile world. It seems like there's a hot breeze that's blowing down at all of our necks, hot air all the time. We live in a world where people are constantly striving and in strife and in tension with each other. Here in Potomac Valley, those of us that are part of the Potomac Valley Church and the Potomac Valley community, we live in a world that's filled with so much competition and expectation and striving. We're just 20 miles outside of Washington, D.C. And though our ministry extends from uh, D.C. all the way down to Fredericksburg, and many of you that are joining us from around the world online, everywhere we seem to turn, there seems to be so much hostility and so much strife. So how do you respond in a world like that? The truth is you have three choices. The first is you can match hostility with hostility. You can fight fire with fire. You can destroy your enemy. You can crush your opponent. And that is the common response that people have in our world. If someone has a political ideology that's different than yours, you crush theirs. If someone has a uh, a monetary Um, benefit that you want to take advantage of, you attack them. We live in a world with so much tension and we have these action movies that seem to play out some of our our fantasies at, at, at destroying the opponent. But when you look at the news, people seem hell bent, if if you will, on matching hostility with hostility. That was one of the choices Jesus has had, and one of the choices we have too. The second choice is you can withdraw. You can say, let the world burn. It's not my problem. Once me and my family are okay, it really doesn't matter. Once me and my people, me and my kind are okay, we're fine. We can separate ourselves. We can choose a monastic life where we circle our wagons and we withdraw. We withdraw into our safe zones, in the bubbles and the echo chambers of people who agree with us, not engaging with people that are not like us. That is another option. But Jesus does not choose any one of those two options. Jesus offers us and chose the third way. It is the way of engaging in the world, walking into the messy middle, choosing a cruciformed approach in the world, and choosing hospitality in a hostile world. Choosing to accept people and love people, to engage with people who think differently than we do and people who think very similarly to the way that we do. This is the way of Jesus. Now, I got to tell you, I have struggled to follow this way. For 28 years now, I've been walking as a disciple of Jesus. I got baptized in August of 1993. And, you know, I was very, very fortunate the past few weeks, my, my family and I, We're able to take a bit of an extended vacation. We're so grateful for the generous posture of the Potomac Valley Church and so grateful for the encouragement of the elders and the support of the staff and the support of all of you for us just to take a time to step back. But I got to tell you, when you take a time to step back, you do a lot of thinking. And I've done a lot of thinking about my life. Tasha and I, next month, will be married for 22 years. I've been blessed with an incredible wife. My son just went off to start his first year of college, and I'm so grateful for him. He's an incredible man of God and a man of great conviction, his own conviction. Our 13-year-old daughter just is in our last year of middle school, going into the eighth grade. We've served in seven churches over this 28-year period. 
23, almost 24 of those years have been served in the ministry. I've made a lot of mistakes. One of the mistakes that I've made is that I have confused my pace and my expectation with Jesus' pace and Jesus' expectation. You know, in the middle of our time of uh, vacation, we're able to to go away for an overnight planning retreat um, with our elders and our staff. And we just talked about where the church is and where we really believe the Holy Spirit's calling us to go. One of the things that was abundantly plain is that so many of our small group leaders have an incredible amount of responsibility that's placed on them. What started out as a simple commitment to lead a Bible discussion in many cases has many of our small group leaders leading small churches with incredible pressure and responsibility. You add to that the the responsibility of raising families, of, you know, navigating traffic, raising, you know, uh, taking care of elderly family members. So many of us have lost family members. Um, Just recently, our dear sister Ruth lost her dad. And we we extend the deepest condolence to the Joneses and to, to their entire family. But so many of you, so many of us, have lost parents or are caring for aging parents. There's a lot of pressure in the world. So how do we offer hospitality when we feel like we have nothing left? That's why we need to look at God's Word. The prophet Jeremiah gives us a window into the heart of God, and into the way of Jesus. Turn on over, if you will, with me to the book of Jeremiah, to Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. So in Jeremiah 6, 16, here's what the prophet says. This is what the Lord says. Not what Will says, not what Marcus or Kai says, not what the elders say, not what we think. This is what the Lord, the God of all gods, the Lord of all lords, the the, the, the Lord of hosts, this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient path. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. The truth is a lot of us reject God's invitation to not follow the modern path or the postmodern path of constantly striving and going and grinding. Instead, we are invited to choose the ancient path, the ancient art of hospitality, to rediscover what it means to be a Christian at its core. Because God's ministry, God's heart, God's love is always one of welcome, of welcome, of engagement in the world. It's so amazing to me how God speaks this to us. In the book of Daniel chapter 2, and for time we won't read it, but in Daniel 2, 44 and 45, the scripture explains that the kingdom of God would come and it would level all threats. It would bring them, bring them down to fine dust. But how would it level those threats? By matching fire with fire? By meeting Rome? By playing Rome's game? No. By withdrawing? No. But by engaging. Engaging in hospitality. One of the greatest testaments to the spirit of Jesus' commitment to hospitality was what he did before he was arrested in the Last Supper. Now what's amazing about the Last Supper account is that this is one of the few things that all four Gospels The three synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John all record. And we're going to take a look at Jesus' example of offering hospitality, starting over in Luke chapter 22. Turn on over with me to Luke 22. We're going to go and learn the ancient way, the way of Jesus. Luke 22 says right here in verse 7 of Luke 22, Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. Remember, Jesus didn't have a place to live. So where are we going to do it? 
And Jesus said, as you enter the city, a man carrying a water jar will meet you. Follow him to the house he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. Now think about this for a second. Jesus is offering hospitality without having a house. Many of us, we're like, I can't offer hospitality. I only got like four chairs and a folding table. Jesus did not have a house, but he offered hospitality. You know, in our community, many of us have big houses, beautiful houses that are well furnished. And yet we hesitate to offer hospitality. Look, the coronavirus is real. But there comes a point at which you've got to make some choices about being around people again. It's important to engage, be safe, be careful, but you need to be around people. Some of us have made the choice not to come to physical in-person service, not because of safety, but because of selfishness. And that's just real. It's time to be engaged with people. And having a house or not having a house was not an excuse for Jesus not to offer hospitality to his 12 disciples. He actually just borrowed someone else's house and used it. It says in verse 13, they left and found things just as Jesus told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and Jesus said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you that I will not eat it again until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Then taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you that I will not drink it again. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Uh, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine at the table. The son of man will go uh, as it is decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. And they began to question among themselves, which of them might be the one who would do this. So there was strife, like who's going to betray Jesus? Now, I want you to watch this next turn that Luke records. Dr. Luke is very careful about the chronology and the detail that he records. So they're having the Passover. Jesus tells them someone's going to betray me. They're questioning who's going to betray him. Verse 24, also a dispute arose among them as to which of them might be considered greatest. And Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, the one who rules, like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? but I am among you as one who serves. You know, this is really amazing. Jesus shows us that it's all about serving people, loving others. His disciples are dealing with the strife of who's going to be the betrayer, coupled with their own internal ambition about who's the greatest. The truth is, the ancient way is about giving not receiving. It's about pouring yourself out for others for a worthy cause. In a world where there's so much competition, would you dare to be someone who serves? Instead of striving to be the best, why not find ways to help others to be better, to be their best? This is the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of risking it all. Now let's look at John's account, and we're going to see some incredible parallels between Luke's account and John's account. John's account is found in John 13. We're doing quite a bit of reading here today because we need to go down deep 
and have a deep biblical understanding of why we do what we do. So that when the rains come and the winds blow, we'll be ready. John 13. I don't know what's going to happen in our world, but I'm not worried because I know who's in charge. And we don't need to be worried because whether in life or death, we stand with God. Many people have become so anxious about their own mortality that they've lost sight of truly living. We're called as disciples to live, to live and to follow the ancient way. And the ancient way involves offering hospitality in a hostile world. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave the world and to go to his Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was around him. And he said to Simon Peter, he said to Simon Peter, who said to he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that is why he said, not everyone is clean. And when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. It's always dangerous to know more than you do. I've read a number of scriptures today, and if you've watched the service so far, I want you to know, you now know a lot of stuff, and you got to do it, because God's going to hold me and you accountable. My responsibility was to deliver the message and also to live it out myself, and your responsibility is to receive the message and to live it out yourself. You know, this passage shows us what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. It is about serving other people. It is about following the example of Christ. Are you willing to get your hands dirty and wash in people's feet? Are you willing to have others sit at the table and serve them? My experience with the Potomac Valley Church is the answer has always been a resounding yes. Yes and yes. We're an incredibly generous congregation, incredibly committed to serving and to giving to others and meeting needs. I'm so impressed by our community's overall posture. But I want to talk to you about your specific decisions. Over the past several months, the conditions that have been around us have created an environment where many of us have withdrawn and have stopped engaging the way that we used to. Some of us are not offering hospitality like we used to. And maybe that's because of fear. Maybe that's because we offered hospitality with shallow conviction. I want to point out that the offer of loving other people, of serving other people, of being there for others, the call to do that is foundational to being a Christian. You know, in the scriptures, for instance, there are over 30 scriptures about loving your enemies. Some of us have felt like we are in enmity 
with each other because we have different political ideologies or different views because we're from different generations or we're from different ethnic groups. But don't you see that's what distinguishes us as Christians? Everybody loves those who love them. But we as Christians, we need to love each other with a deep and abiding love. This is what distinguishes us. This is what breaks down every barrier. It is our commitment to offering hospitality that shows our love for God. Luke 6, 27 through 36 helps us to understand that. And I encourage you to read through that passage. That's what it looks like, loving others. Over the next several weeks, Tasha and I will be meeting with all the different leaders in the church and talking about our simplified forward strategy, our commitment as a church to rediscover the ancient way of hospitality, to walk in this ancient way. What that will mean is that our calendar as we go into September and into the rest of the fall will be streamlined with many, 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 many less activities than we've had in the past. I want to encourage you not to fill up your calendar with more sporting events or uh, activities that you go to that, that drain you of energy, but rather that you take this fall to focus on really being hospitable, getting to know your neighbors to the left and to the right of you, getting to know the people that are in your classes and your coworkers, spending time and going out to dinners and breaking bread or going into homes and meeting with people and breaking bread with them there. You know, the truth is, Jesus is the Lord of hosts. He is a generous giver. And he hosted a dinner without even having a house. He shows us how to serve on every turn. And he calls us to understand that the heart of Christianity is hospitality. That's what it's all about. So I want to leave you with an action, something for you to do, a clear call to action. This week, not this month, this week, this week, extend or offer hospitality to one person or to one family. Now that can be to another believer, or that can be to someone who's seeking God, that can be to someone who's completely different than you are or someone who's very similar to who you are. But let's practically exercise what it means to be like Jesus. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at how Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, continued to offer hospitality even after he died, was buried, and rose from the dead. We're going to look at the response of the early church and how the early church practiced hospitality in so many amazing ways. We're going to look at the power of withness, of being with people, and that being with people is perhaps our biggest witness, because a lot of times we give people an invitation to church, but we don't take time to share our faith, which involves sharing our lives as well. We're going to take time to really dig deep into understanding this. But as we go into this next week, I want to give you another scripture to memorize. Because meditating on God's word and letting it sink deep into your heart is central to our transformation. So I want to challenge all of us to memorize the words of Jesus in John 13, verse 15. I have set you an example that you have done as I, that you should do as I've done for you. I need, I clearly need to memorize it. So I'm going to read it one more time. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I'm honored to be a part of this fellowship. And I'm honored to have discovered, to have rediscovered the third way. That in a hostile world, I don't have to be hostile. In a hostile world, I don't have to run away. In a hostile world, I can learn how to be hospitable. Let's pray for the communion right now. God, as we take this bread and this juice that represents your son's broken body, we recognize that in the midst of incredible turmoil internally, 
you offered hospitality. You didn't let the conditions of the world around you dictate how you were going to be. You didn't let it tempt you to give way to fear and to, to want to prove yourself or to want to live for yourself. Instead, you gave your life completely, devoted your life to be an example for us. You showed us that it's not about being great, but about being a servant. You showed us that it's not about striving, it's about serving. You showed us, God, from your example, that you're willing to stoop down and wash our feet to make us whole and to make us clean. And so as we take this bread and juice, we take it recognizing that for 2,000 years, your ancient example has been one of hospitality, of offering hospitality. Help us, God, to internalize this fully so that as we commune together, it would help us to develop a conviction to engage with the world around us, not to withdraw from it, not to be afraid of it, not to fear death, to be wise and to be responsible, but to learn how to truly live, live lives of hospitality. Please, God, raise up men and women within the church to be able to open up their homes to host small groups and discussions and activities and engagements that will help people to draw closer to you and to see you in new ways. Use our gifts and talents to help us to draw close to you, God, so that our act of communion would bring people closer to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you have an incredible week. And remember to memorize your scripture, John 13 and verse 15.